name is Luing Nguyen. My Vietnamese name is Nguyen Duy Luong and uh, global investor by training. Uh, I sit on the board of HK Film, uh, one of the largest film studios in Vietnam. Uh, about a, 10 years or so ago, I led a group of investors uh, to take an ownership stake in HK Film and uh, been part of their growth uh, ever since. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all of so you and I have known each other for a long, long, long time. And uh, many years ago, but uh, here we are today. So thank you for coming on to the podcast. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. So I understand that you spent seven years in Japan. Can you tell me how that all went down? And the reason why I want to ask you that is because I think we're going to go into some um, I hate to use the word comparison, but factory growth uh, cycles, all of that. Um, I'm very interested in, you know, Japan's, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, all the developing countries sure. that are right behind and trailing these big countries. And I want to hear your time in, in Japan. Sure. Uh, I came to the U.S. in 77. Um, we landed in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, and that was in the middle of the oil boom, lots of jobs. Um, we came via Rome, Italy through some family uh, connections there. So when we arrived there, um, we Japan was just starting to, to rise in the world. So going from making cheap products to now legitimately high quality goods. And so growing up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, very few other Asian Americans just watching the rise of Japan, taking over the sort of the economic world, buying Rockefeller Center. And I mean, they, they were just, they were just rocking and rolling. And so through proxy of, hey, I want to be proud being Asian in my youth's mind, I started uh, focusing on Japan. And uh, <clears throat> sophomore year of high school, I uh, was fortunate to win a scholarship to go to Japan for a summer. And I went to Nagoya and um, spent a, a summer there with a Japanese family along with, you know, a gob of other uh, Amer young American students. And that was my first exposure to Japan. Uh, came back, uh, started learning Japanese on my own. Uh, when I went to grad school, uh, when I went to uh, undergrad, I, I learned Japanese as a, um, my language. And so Japan became a real strong focus uh, of, of my career path. And and then uh, as with anything, once you win one scholarship, it's easier to win another. And, and so I ended up winning a couple more that sent me back to Japan again. And um, this was now the early 90s and Japan was sort of at the peak uh, of its dominance. Um, and then when I came out of school, I had decided that I wanted to go to Japan to learn the language and really uh, work there. And so at that point, I had been to Japan a couple of times and I realized that in the big cities, there are lots of really good English speakers and it, they make it so easy for you to enjoy the city and hang out. Uh, and it made it very difficult to learn the language. And my focus was to really learn the Japanese language. So when I went to Japan after college uh, to to do work with the Japanese government, I specifically asked to be sent to a, a, a place far from the big cities. So they sent me to an island in Japan. So Japan is made of four islands. Uh, they sent me to the smallest of the four islands. And on that island, there are four states. And I went to the, uh, the smallest of the four states. And <clears throat> it was a bit countryside. And so I ended up spending two years there, very few English speakers, uh, and my Japanese exploded. Wow. Um, and and um, funny enough, when I went to grad school in Tokyo, people were like, where the heck did you learn your Japanese? Because it sounds like country Japanese. Wow. Um, and, yeah. and it was. And um, amazing two years of my life there. Um, I was... Uh, uh, learning Japanese and we had these long breaks because I was part of the school system in Japan. 
And Japan being in the middle of Asia, it was just really easy to jump around to all these countries. And the yen was super strong. Um, and so it's a, you know, I was in my early twenties at this point. Um, it was just a, a period of tremendous, uh, intellectual and, and uh, growth, um, and, uh, <clears throat> really drove my passion for, for Asia, uh, uh, on a global basis. Um, and, and I went to the Philippines, I went to Thailand, Malaysia, and just, you know, it was easy to travel. But did you go to Vietnam? I made my first trip to Vietnam in 94. I um, I went from Hanoi. Uh, I spent a month from Hanoi to to Saigon. Uh, backpacked. I had a ponytail back then, if you can imagine, uh, Kenneth. And uh, people couldn't tell if I was uh, a Cambodian or a Vietnamese or a Japanese. And <clears throat> and I spoke Japanese pretty well at that point. Uh, and I would you know I would talk to other Japanese tourists, and people had thought I was Japanese. Um, but that was my first trip to Vietnam, and um, I was just recently in Da Nang over the summer, and I was recounting my my first trip to Da Nang in uh, Da Nang in '94, uh, and there were barely uh, dirt, there were barely paved roads, uh, maybe one or two, um, and it's just amazing to see the growth now. But that was my first trip to to Vietnam uh, in '94, and and so. I, uh, I came back to the U.S. Um, <clears throat> and so um, after that program, I ended up going to Tokyo for uh, to go to, to uh, a university there. I did my grad part of my graduate work was at a, a university called Waseda, which is think of them as like Stanford of Japan. Um, <clears throat> and from there, I, I landed at a German investment bank. Uh, I worked there for a bit and then the Asian currency crisis happened. Um, and so now we're, now we're at the end of the late, now we're in the late nineties, right? So the Asian currency crisis rolled through Asia, uh, decimated the financial industry. Um, and at that point I looked around I, and I was doing business in Japanese. I was negotiating in Japanese and, um, and now I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting to the, end up my late twenties and decided to come back to the U S and, um, uh, a, an investment firm in San Diego was looking for a Japanese specialist and in their, you know, in their mind, they thought they were going to, you know, they're, they're going to hire this Vietnamese guy who could speak Japanese. And I landed with them in San Diego. Uh, and I would go back to Japan three times a year, four times a year. Um, and so Japan was a big, big part of my life. Uh, for uh, over a decade, um, and it was a, a big uh, defining element of of my identity as as uh, an Asian American. But it was also it also really helped my Vietnamese side. Like my Vietnamese language massively improved because of my Japanese. Because like you know, I grew up speaking sort of you know kitchen Vietnamese, right and the words that are used, the vocabulary words for much more sophisticated, much more complex issues weren't really being used. But because my Japanese was being used for that, and many of them are directly, you know, from Chinese, like they were, they're really the same word. Um, like Junbi in Vietnamese is Junbi in, 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 in Japanese, Taidol, Taidol in, in, in Japanese. Wow. And so, yeah, my Japanese, my Vietnamese really uh, improved because of my Japanese. Um, you know, I I knew that the um, you know, the derivative, the roots, a lot of the root words of Vietnam comes from Mandarin. Um, but you know, as the years goes on, I I realized that uh, Korean and Japanese all share this sort of this base language of of Mandarin uh, because. Everybody comes from China, and the f the fact that you know you were so um, so well versed in Japanese to to learn Vietnamese is so uh, pretty mind boggling. Yeah, I at some point I figured out that if I if I thought in Vietnamese, my Japanese would come out a lot more uh, um, uh, natural, a lot more native. Because you know the English language requires a subject, a verb, an object, 
uh, while Vietnamese is all very context based, like you know, you don't say I go to the store. You're like, you know, Ni right? And so the Japanese is very similar in that in sort of in spoken day to day Japanese. I found out that if I if I first started thinking in Vietnamese, my Japanese would come out a lot more native and a lot more uh, casual. Uh, How cool is that? You know, yeah. you know, as you're telling me this story, this journey of of you and in, in the Japanese, I, I wish I'm sitting here thinking that I wish that more Vietnamese Americans or Vietnamese diaspora kids get more into or falling in love with how cool the Vietnamese language is or how cool the Vietnamese history is, just in the same way that I think you in the 90s fell in love with the Japanese culture. And I think it's changing. A lot of it is changing because you and I growing up in the 90s, I think there was a lot of shame involved in being Vietnamese during that time. And I think switching over to Japanese, which was a very cool culture, it still is a very cool culture today. But we need that polish and that that kind of that it today in this era. We we would love to, I'd love to have that um, more and more pumped into sort of like the young minds of of Vietnamese um, and even foreigners, like you know, why, why, why stop at just Vietnamese kids? It'd be cool to have everybody wanting to learn Vietnamese and listen to V pop and watch Vietnamese films. Yeah, I think uh, the tension for us, uh, first generation Vietnamese, is you know, we come here, we know we lost a war, right? So we come, we come with baggage. We were trying really difficult to be educated and fit into the American society. And the Vietnam War, the Vietnam metaphor is typically used to express a difficult situation or quagmire where it's difficult to extract yourself from. So the Viet so like oftentimes the Vietnam War is used in that context of, you know, social unrest. Uh, difficult situation where you, you there is no right answer to get out of, and so now you sit there and the, you know it's it's in the back of your head that your heritage is associated to this particular use in the Vietnamese and in, into the in the English language, and many of us push ourselves to be intelligent and to be well read and to be versed in how to speak in in sort of you know political uh, and, and intellectual circles. And now you're forced to kind of use that Vietnam metaphor in a way that is is not self self uh, benefiting, and that's a tension. I think I I mean I'm speaking for myself obviously, but uh, I imagine it's true for many. Navigating that tension and trying to own it, um, and so and I'm being an investor, I'm very keen on the economics of things. And so for, you know, if you think about when we were growing up, if someone said, hey, let's go get Japanese food in people's minds, they're like, OK, I'm going to drop 75, 100 bucks because it's a premium experience. Right. And you say, hey, let's go get Chinese food. People say to themselves, OK, it could be on the cheaper end. It could be on the higher end. It depends on what it is. But because the way that the Vietnamese culinary uh, experience happened, the journey, there was a time when you when you say, let's go get Vietnamese food. And they're like, OK, it's going to be a two dollar egg roll and a five dollar pho. Or, you know, I'm quoting yeah. myself on the pricing, but they just they just assume it was going to be cheap food, uh, cheap food uh, and, and sort of uh, a low end experience. Now you got all these amazing chefs and all these amazing restaurant tours who are pushing that envelope, shredding that fabric. Yeah, but we but we grew up with that, and we get integrate that in, into our our psyche of being Vietnamese American. And back to your point about language, I think one of the one of the things that I really appreciate in learning Japanese was. There were words that I really love in the Japanese language and what it expressed that that there wasn't a, a, a U.S. equivalent. And because of sort of recognizing that there are the you know there are these words that are really quite beautiful, it made me attuned to that to the Vietnamese language as well. And like, you know, we 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 just saw that movie Rue, and Rue is one of my favorite Vietnamese words because it's it's there's so much beauty in it. Mm -hmm. 
it's not a direct translation of it in English. I don't think la. I mean, ru is a lullaby. Verb. That's, lullaby is a noun, right? Yeah. Ru is a verb. Um, I think um, so. Yeah. I mean, there there are these words that I just I just really um, appreciate in in the Vietnamese language and gong and oi and and all these these expressions that I think really makes the Vietnamese language and it it I grew into that appreciation through this sort of awkward cycle, awkward journey through the Viet, uh, through the Japanese language. But, um, and so after that trip to Vietnam, I came back and I'm like, you know, my Japanese was at that point, my Japanese was way better than my Vietnamese. Like I could, you know, I'm giving, you know, talks in Japanese in front of hundreds of people. I wouldn't be able to do that in Vietnamese at that time. And so I really came back and, 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 uh, and, and focus on my Vietnamese and, and, um, and so I'm very, uh, blessed to have made that journey. You know, one really random word, uh, that I remember, I lived in Japan for a year in 94. I lived in Okinawa. Okay. And one word I will never forget is kawaii, right? I'll never forget that because everybody was using it. And they would, you know, throw up their little peace signs and they, oh, kawaii, right? And it was such a memorable word because, you know, these girls would say it and, you know, everything that was like cutesy, you know, Hello Kitty was, everything was kawaii. And then as I gotten, you know, through that year, I was like, wait a minute, that word comes in the form of Vietnamese, kai. <laughs> Interesting, right? Yeah. It's kai, it. kai and kawaii yeah. is the same thing. Yeah, no, I love it. I haven't ever thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. And then my Mandarin it's... family, my Mandarin side of the family, there's a the same word, uh, the equivalent in Ch in Mandarin as well that oh. has a kawaii, you know, a sound to it. And it never left me. I was like, oh my God, all these languages are are really interconnected with the they're stitched together. Yeah. And I think if you if you are a student of history, it reminds us it reminded me that I'm just part of a stream of time. Like so much has happened before us and and that we are now just uh, on this, this this time journey on um river of life and um these words, these these and even concepts that keep that comes up that if you didn't have the context that you think it's so unique, but in reality it's like it's it's part of something much larger that's that's come before us. Can you imagine if we had podcasts like 400 years ago and two guys were talking about or two women were talking about, you know, the 400 years ago or even in Roman times, how just mind blowing yeah. that would be? Yeah. And I think it's, it's the slice of life that, yeah. that these podcasts are able to bring um, because it gets lost. It gets lost in the pages of history and it gets lost over time. But it's, you know, these... Um, um, these slices of life that I think is worth celebrating and bringing up, and um, just randomly, it just it, 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 uh, a memory just occurred to me. But um, when I was on this island in Japan, they're known for their udon, and it's called sanuki udon. And sanuki is the the old term for for that that land. Um, that's the old name for it. And in Japan, when you have udon, it's typically people are like sanuki udon, which is really quite famous. And near where I live was this little small udon shop. I walked in, owned by two brothers, and there's a guy making udon, right, fresh right there. And I was like in my early 20s, so this is like, you know, early, you know, uh, 90s, you know, and I'm like, gosh, how inefficient. Like the guy's making udon every day. I'm like, why can't I just, you know, buy a machine? <laughs> and I would, but I would go there all the time because this udon was so good. It wasn't Literally, until you know. years, years later, years later, did I realize what a treat I had. Like there was like there was like this artist making fresh udon, and I'm like, I was so dumb and un sort of worldly to realize, oh my gosh, like this is the gift. Artist. The gift of making it daily is the gift. Is daily. why it's, it's so damn good. Yep. And the guy, like, I remember sitting there eating and watching and I'm like, how inefficient. Um, and same thing with coffee. Um, we had, 
we didn't have a coffee machine in the office. We had pour over coffee, right? This was back in the early 90s. And again, I'm like, why are we doing pour over coffee? This is ridiculous. Like, this is like, you should just get a machine like we have in the U.S. Because the mm -hmm. U.S. is the best. And again, years and years later, now pour, pour over coffee is like the thing. And you're paying like seven bucks for it, right? See, and that's the thing that I think the Japanese got right with their process, right? Their, their process-driven, uh, commercial, viable, you know, um, merchandise, right? Everything that they do is sort of like this process-driven quality. I don't know if it's like that now, but I think that the Japanese have a reputation for, you know, high-end, handcrafted um, food, uh, merchandise, and I think the Vietnamese throughout the years, I think there's a return to that or a drifting into that lane. But when you go to Vietnam today, you you could see the appreciation or the patina of like the walls and you feel like the customized sort of outlook of Vietnamese people in the big cities understand sort of like the the fragrance of history that's left behind from the French and, and all the layers that... And I think it's... We, we are beginning to appreciate that more, I think, in Vietnamese American society about Vietnam. Not, I agree. Not, yeah. We are, yeah, we're, yeah. and I think we, we're, we're, well, we're, we're, it wasn't that long ago where, I mean, from, from myself, we were food insecure, housing insecure, physically insecure. And, you know, just on the hierarchy of needs, it was just about getting those daily things, you know, in place and, uh, now we have, you know, blessed with uh, the, the capacity to enjoy the finer things um, and, and you know, the quiet luxury, right? Like that's a term that people use now. But I, to your point, though, I think there is there are lots to like about the Japanese culture and there's lots not to like about the Japanese culture. But one of the things that I really appreciate with uh, with uh, up the, about the Japanese culture is this appreciation for doing things at a really high level. And whether it's an udon shop on a small island uh, in Japan in, in Japan or you know um, uh, a teppanyaki in, in, in Tokyo, you know cooked over a lava stone. Like it's just it's really a, a, a deep appreciation for the details that are not um, clear and, and blatant, right? I mean, like you have to ask to see, to, to really appreciate. Um, and, and I think that's what I really appreciate, I really love about the Japanese culture is this, is this, um, this uh, subtleness. Um, we, we were over, we were in Japan over the summer, my daughters and I, we were in Kyoto um, one of my favorite cities in the world. And, um, prior to this trip, every time I go to Kyoto, it's a day trip from Osaka because it's like a, you know, 30, 40 minute train ride. But this time around, I wanted to stay in Kyoto and I want to stay in a, in a real con, which is a, a traditional Japanese inn. And so we got there, we stay in, and we were a little early and I was looking for a place to kind of hide out from the heat with the girls. And I Googled sort of, you know, closest Kisaten, which is a cafe in Japanese. And so we walked to this place that was around the corner and it was down this cobblestone streets, you know, into this kind of like nondescript house. And the cafe was literally uh, an upla uh, a rectangular living room with one part of one side of the rectangle, uh, a full length window floor to ceiling open onto a private Japanese garden spectacular and the furnishing was super simple and luckily we were the only three in this place and we had this private garden uh manicured and I was speaking with the woman the the proprietor and I'm, I'm like what is this like where did this come from? What a gym. And, and she said, you know, we grew up as gardeners and we, we, we wanted to cultivate this. And, um, so we're sitting there sipping on tea and Sprite and Coke and, and it's just a spectacular. And 
super understated, but it's the elegance of it was breathtaking. And and I was really happy that my daughters got to see that because you can't describe you know, I'm trying to describe it and you can see that I'm really struggling. But once you when you see it, you're just like, okay, this is you know, what the Japanese call wabi sabi, like this 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 sense of of refinement that is understated and and uh yeah it's it's wonderful i'm trying to formulate the question of how your japanese experience and working inside of vietnam whether it's the film industry or finance industry or just being there culturally inside your head i'm trying to figure out how this all works out for you because of the levels of quality, the levels of process. You know, what's your thought on where Vietnam is going today? Where is it heading? Big question. Um, so I, my Vietnam investment journey started some 15 years ago. Um, so I um, I stood up a investment firm, uh, my own investment firm, and when I did that, my former boss called one day and said, "There is this family in Europe who wants to invest in Vietnam. Uh, can you help them?" And I said, "Sure." So they engaged me. Um, it was a modest seven-figure amount. And at the time I bought, uh, I was investing their money in the stock market, in the Vietnamese stock market. And so I would go, I, I would start going, um, and this was early 2000. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm what's called a CFA, which is sort of an investment designation. It's kind of like a CPA uh, for investments. And... Uh, you know, it takes three years to take, and and it's a a, a U.S. Designa designation that it be, slowly became global. When I went to Vietnam, there was maybe one other CFA that I ran into, and there were a couple of other young people who were just starting to take the first of their three exams, right? And now CFAs are everywhere in Vietnam. It's so just sort of a, a an antidote of the progress. So anyway, so I started investing in Vietnam um, and in the stock market, and you know we 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 Vina Sun, the taxi company, we had a big stake in that. We did well, and through that investment journey, I'm I'm meeting with you know Dominic at Dragon Fund, uh, Don Lamb at Vina Capital, Henry uh, at IDG, and you know develop sort of that relationship with of other fund managers there. And in the course of that adventure, um, I was approached by another group of investors who said, we've been wanting to invest in Vietnam, but we haven't found anything. And we want to invest in private companies and not in the stock market. And that's how the HK film investment happened. So I, 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 we did, we scan available opportunities um, and we saw uh, potentials in, in the Vietnamese uh, content and entertainment uh, uh, industry. And so we came in uh, for a sizable minority stake. Uh, I negotiated that. And mm -hmm. as part of the deal, as part of that that transaction, I joined the board to represent our, our investors. Uh, and these are European mm -hmm. investors. And so through the course of the last 10, 11 years or so, watching the Vietnamese industry, the film industry grow, watching it um, uh, change, uh, disrupted by technology. You know, it's, it's um, and also by virtue of the other investment activities that I was doing in Vietnam, <clears throat> also seeing uh, how, how uh, the Vietnamese business environment was changing generally as well. And I think there's a real distinct, there's a real delineation between the younger generation who grew up reasonably uh, comfortable in Vietnam, uh, reasonably affluent, go to the U.S., go to Australia, go to London, go to England to to, to get their degrees, to you know work, get some experience, and then they come back. Um, 
And that's, I think, is a real exciting um, wave of young people. Uh, and so, again, it wasn't that long ago where Vietnam was, you know, um, not, uh, it was economically struggling. Um, and, you know, and to some degree, in the grand scope of the global uh, environment, Vietnam is still a frontier country, right? Um, in, in the hierarchy of investment opportunities. Uh, and so I think from my vantage point, and, and I'm not a scholar in this, I don't study it. I'm just, I'm a practitioner. So it's, it's a little different. Um, but I think like similar to, to like Japan was decimated after World War II and in one generation went from third world country to first world country. Unheard of at that time. And large part because the physical infrastructure was destroyed, the physical assets were destroyed, but the intangible assets, the intellectual, the drive, the focus of the people were still there. And they were then provided with the capital and, and the support uh, by, by the U.S. and other uh, entities, other governments. They then experienced this tremendous growth, right? And certainly there were exogenous issues like the Korea war and yep. all that, that helps sort of, but so when I look at, at Vietnam, again, physical infrastructure was destroyed, physical assets were destroyed, but the, the, the intelligence and the, you know, the intangible in of the people were still there and that, and drove that immediate growth. Um, and that growth was all built around like, with, you know, in a very, typical economic development pattern around physical goods, physical you know, housing, roads, <clears throat> mining, coffee, shrimp, like all the, you know, the, the, the commodities, right? That, that, that the global market was willing to buy. And because Vietnam has a young population and because Vietnam has um, grown the way that it has, there's now this ability to be inner to focus on the inner economy, to the domestic economy around consumption, around right. um, experiences and, and and goods and 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 the consumers are becoming much more discerning, right? In terms of you know they're willing to pay for the cheap stuff, Great, but they're also willing to pay out for the good stuff because they there there's there's quality there, and it's very similar to U.S. consumers. And so now you have this this class of young entrepreneurs who are able, who have the training, the experience, and the capital to be able to address these 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 uh, market needs. And so that I think is a really uh, exciting uh, thing to see in the in the Vietnamese market. <clears throat> and so, you know, with my sort of lens coming from Japan and coming and doing investing, and there's a distinction between uh, an investor and an operator, right? So, anyway, so if you have, if you ask the same question to someone who operates in Vietnam, they may have a different perspective than someone like myself who's an investor outside looking in. I think the, the, the quality of the team, the quality of the visions um, really have improved. Um, and, you know, and I think um, what you really see, where, where, you, where you really see this is in the startup uh, segment in Vietnam, the startup niche in Vietnam, which I think is, is worth watching and following. Um, and this whole notion of, you can come up with concepts. You could beta it in Vietnam on the cheap, figure it out, and then take it global, um, which I think is a really interesting play. And so, so from from the standpoint of watching Vietnam's growth and, and how um, there's advancement uh, driven by young energy, young blood, driven by um, domestic consumption, uh, as being a bigger part of engine of growth in Vietnam and, and a more discerning taste um, and demand of, of quality. And you see this in the film business as well, right? You see it in terms of the, the quality of the film that's coming out um, and, and quality is a very 
loose term, but you know, it could be the production value, it could be the quality of the scripts, it could be both. Like you know, but but there is now much more uh, of a discerning uh, uh, um, uh, requirement from from the audience. But you know, what lingers in my mind is this aspect of legal structure, legal infrastructure, or the lack of legal infrastructure. When you were bringing money, this modest seven figure into Vietnam for this family and re or, or investing it into companies in Vietnam, I mean, that concern of legal infrastructure today is still haunting many modern money uh, that's coming from outside of Vietnam. It haunts so many people to hear about like family members losing their their shirts um, in deals. And it's because we don't have an ironclad legal infrastructure in Vietnam to protect uh, commercial deals and, and, you know, film deals and getting the money out of Vietnam. All of these infrastructural issues are such a big thing. What made you decide that, okay, I'm going to bring in all this money into Vietnam back in the 15 years ago and go, okay, I'm going to sleep easy knowing that it's okay. Yes. And these are all very valid uh, concerns. Um, and in some, you would think that you would only do it if you, you're you getting paid for the extra risk that you're taking on, right? If you, if you have investment opportunities here in the U.S. that's paying you IRR of 15, 20%, you should do it in the U.S., right? You would only do it in Vietnam if you feel like you're getting super return for the risk that you're incurring, because these are all these are all very valid risks. Um, the good thing is it can only get better. <laughs> and so when you when you ask Vietnamese people or even government officials, it's the laws are there. They're all there. They're all all the laws are there to protect. It's about compliance. It's about ex enforcement of those laws, and that's that's a struggle. And so it's a real drag. Like we, we often think at HK Film where if we were to, you know, back up the truck on a young director, like how are we going to fully benefit from, you know, all the risks that we've incurred in backing this, this, this director, this writer who can just walk across the street and, and work for someone else. And so because if we think like that, we're going to spend less. And if the studio across the street is thinking like that, they're going to spend less. And so because of that, there is a lack of in, like full on investment because yeah. you're, you're, you know, unless you're, yes. And, and you know, everyone's trying to figure out how, if I'm going to invest this, how am I going to be able to protect it? And they're not going to walk across the street. So then where, where your head goes to is typically hard assets, theaters, equipment, cameras, right? And that's what we you know. That's a that's a bulk of what HK Film does is we own the deepest and largest inventory and the most modern inventory of, of filming equipment in Vietnam. Mm. So production so service. I would I would say ninety percent of films in Vietnam either rent directly from us or rent through someone who comes to us, right? Because we, we just have the deepest, deepest uh, uh, inventory. And so, um, so that's a, that's a solid cash generator for us, right? And, and cash flow generator for us. And so what happens because of this lack of, of compliance and, and oversight um, uh, and enforcement, investors naturally don't want to do, you know, IPs that they can't control or go into blind pools of, um, script production and script banks because they're like how how are we going to benefit from that because that that's just going to get you know completely um, taken away and it's 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 a conversation point that we don't necessarily have the ability to to change and that's going to have to come from the top down um, where we operate is recognizing that the film business in Vietnam is small. Right. We all, everyone knows each other. And if you're kind of known as someone who doesn't play straight and, 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 and isn't uh, a friendly, someone friendly in the sandbox that you're probably not going to be able to get another deal. Um, and so, um, we're, we're, 
we're very focused on that protection of not IPs, but relationship, protecting yeah. relationships and, and being very um, critical and, and um, discerning about the, the relationship that we're going to back. Because to your point, so you know, just taking a step back, laws and, and, and regulations are in place as a substitute for trust and uh, trust and, and, and personal relationships, right? And so in the environment where you don't have the laws and the regulations to protect you, then you fall on back on that trust. And sometimes, you know, you you go in on not the greatest investment because you're building this relationship or you're maintaining a relationship because they need capital to, 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 to get this film done. Um, and then sometimes they do the same for, for us. Um, and so, um, but I, I, I do, you know, what you're also seeing in the film business is you entrepreneurs from other industries who've done very well for themselves now coming and looking at the film business and saying, you know, I'm intrigued by this. I'm intrigued by um, what I can do here. And they're bringing best practices and, and sort of ideas. And, and so I think there's, there's, there's a techno there's the hard technology disruption of streaming and, and, you know, these, but there's also the disruption of new ideas and new practices that are coming. Um, and, you know, HK Films been, you know, HK Film has 150 something employees, been around for 15 something years. And it's nice to have sort of these these outside factors driving our our our, uh, our evolution. And now, when I uh, think about the work that you do in the United States, it's um, a little bit different. It's um, the company that you're the CFO for is uh, Mission Driven Finance, and your mission at Mission Driven Finance is a very interesting one. Can we talk about that? And can we talk about how um, perhaps it relates to this, I, I think it's a new paradigm of the way we look at employee to employers uh, relationships uh, here in the United States. And then I want to even get it, you know, how does this relate to the working uh, class in Vietnam? And is it changing? Um, because it's changing here in, the, in America, it's changing. Yeah, I, I would think, I uh, hope, answer all that and I, I think there is a decent overlap between what I do in the US and what I do in Vietnam um, so at the core uh, impact investing is is this generally new it's been around for maybe 15 years as a, as a term but the concept is how do you do business how do you invest in a way that makes money but also do good for the world and solve a social pain point so Churches, temples, synagogues been doing this for centuries, right? Like investing in in farms and investing in dormitories and for the the, the benefit of, of their community. As a professional term, it was coined by the Rockefeller uh, Foundation some 13, 14 years ago. And it's the idea, again, of deploying capital that makes money for your clients but at the same time doing something good for the world. Something good for the world is a very broad expression, right? It could be, you could be creating jobs, could be creating hospitals in a, in a place that doesn't have care, uh, standing up a grocery store in a food desert. And so all that falls into this, this, this idea of impact investing. So as the chief investment officer of Mission Driven Finance, you know, we uh, we put out about a million and a half a month of loans to small businesses and nonprofits. Um, so think of um, a Muslim grocery store that needed to expand because of an influx in Afghan and Somalians in the community. Uh, we provide a capital for that. Um, a um, a Vietnamese own uh, uh, by a medical device manufacturer landed a million dollar um, contract with a large pharmaceutical company. They did have the money to to buy the material, the you know to, to to execute on this contract. We provided that loan for them, 
when they first came to us, they had like six employees, mostly Vietnamese, Vietnamese owned, Vietnamese employees, and in San Diego here. And by the third loan that they did with us, they are now 50 employees. You go in and, you know, the cubby holes of all the employees, and it's Nguyen Le, Tran, Hernandez, you know, and like it's just all people of color. And it's it's really yeah. wonderful the work that they're doing. So we provide capital for that. Um, and so, so in the work that this company does, they're creating quality jobs. They're, they're treating employees well with training. Um, and so I think to your point of this change in mindset, there's in the U S there's a term called shareholder supremacy. Like everything public companies do is around keeping shareholders happy. And, and that's all about profit. It's all about stock price. Now there's a movement towards stakeholders, right? From employees to the communities, a broader scope of who is benefiting from the work that this company does. And so many smaller companies, what I call the side streets of America, right? You got Main Street of America. You got the, you got Wall Street. You got Main Street, which is the larger firms. And then you got the side streets. These are first generation entrepreneurs. These are like refugees standing up businesses. These, you know, single white mom having a small, you know, coffee shop. And they're taking care, they're recognizing and, and, and truly living, supporting the stakeholders in their community and that the business operates in. So from employees to, to the community and to their investors as well. And there's also, um, so when I think about HK Film and the work that I do there, we, we employ 150 people, right? Where, you know, instead of young people coming in from the rural area, instead of landing at a garden store or landing in, in a, a restaurant, like they are now part of this entertainment business and this, this studio creating these jobs. Um, one of the first investment, one of the first purchases uh, HK did when we came in was the acquisition of a phantom camera which is, you know, a high speed camera. When you see footages of a bullet going into an apple and the apple shattering, like that's what a phantom camera does. It's ability to do, to be able to capture at that high speed. Prior, prior to HK Film buying that, if anyone in Vietnam wanted to, to use it, they would have to rent it from a guy in the Philippines who would bring it over with three people who would operate it carry it, maintain it, bring it back to the Philippines. No one even touched it. So there was a complete rent situation, no transfer of know-how, no transfer of technology. And so when we came into HK Film, that was one of the first thing we did was purchase this thing. It was, it was for a long time, the only phantom camera in Vietnam. Transfer of technology, which is a huge, the ability to move an industry forward, the, the, the know-how of an industry moving it forward. And a cottage industry sprouting up around people maintaining it, taking care of it, uh, uh, and using it. So to me, HK Film sits squarely in impact investing. Um, certainly, we're there to make money. And I, th I think as we are nudging and pushing HK to grow and the whole industry, the entertainment industry to grow in Vietnam, that is impact investing. And so... Here in the U.S., around films, you see some film project origin. If you see that that film, uh, that was financed by Impact Investor. Um, so anyway, so so what I do here in the U.S. is um, providing capital for social enterprise entrepreneurs who are solving social pain points, uh, whether it be you know affordable housing or, or anything else. And so. Um, <clears throat> It's a fairly new uh, discipline in the world of investing, um, and uh, it's an exciting space. I think it's it's one of I would you know I encourage young people to look into it, um, and because it's it's a really a nice intersection between value driven and and and, uh, and finance. I I think that um, 
just knowing you all, all these years and knowing your deep faith in, in the Catholic uh, sort of religion and, and that journey, and I think about the work you do with impact investing, I can't help but think that those two are kind of tied together because um, you brought up in there in our conversation today um, the church's work with you know the properties and the 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 uh, the different projects that the Catholic Church might have um, and I think you know your background of being a Catholic has something to do with this idea of impact investing but does it really work and I, it's a two-part question how much of your you know your upbringing in your faith is involved in this sort of direction with impact uh, investing and does it really work? Does this idea of you know mutually beneficial models like this does it really work for society? It might work for you because of your deep faith in in doing the right thing, right? But I question that right now, um, and I don't mean to be antagonistic, but I just question it just as a as somebody who's curious about it. Uh, and and it's a valid question. <clears throat> I think what we call sort of traditional investors think of impact investing as, you know, tree hugging, you know, uh, spraying money, hoping, praying that it comes back, no pun intended in the religious element there. Um, and, and, I, and I think there is some valid critique there because oftentimes the people who come up with these ideas of a fund, <clears throat> I'm raising a fund to support indigenous American uh, around, you know, Cybersecurity. I'm just making up stuff, right? And it it sounds passionate. It sounds cool to raise the money for it, but there's just not the the universe of investable uh, ideas just aren't there. The quality and the, the 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 quality of the entrepreneurs aren't there. So, and then so the landscape of impact investing is scattered with uh, carcasses of of ideas that's fallen flat. And lost money to investors, so I think it's a very valid uh, critique. Um, and I think we are growing and evolving as as an industry. Um, and so I can't speak for all, but the work that we do, um, just for example, doing COVID, we were provided a little over five million dollars to lend to nonprofits in San Diego. Um, who were decimated by by COVID. And when I was asked to think about how we would deploy that in a prudent manner, the investor said, Louis, if I can get 60, 70% of my money back, I'm, I'm happy. Like he, he was expecting, or this foundation was expecting high loss. And I came up with this underwriting protocol um, that, recognize sort of this exogenous shock that happened to to our world and we deployed this five million and we recently repaid the investor uh their money we repaid a month early and we repaid them 99.9 percent .9 of their money we lost two thousand dollars out of the five million dollars um and so I, I I think your healthy skepticism is valid. And there are very passionate speakers around impact because it's something that can really get people going, like dogs, pets, and you know, babies and poverty and stuff like that. But at the end of the I tell I tell my mentees and I tell my my staff, we still have to obey the physics of investing. Like it still mm -hmm. has we have to be able to hang our hat on crucial due diligence and i'm like if the sec comes rolling in and they're like why did you do this deal i have to be able to to, to defend like at that time here are the reasons why it made sense it may or may not play itself out but so we spent a lot of time uh digging in when i i was um when i first started with mdf i was employee one and we had five employees and now we're at close to 50. My research staff, in addition to myself, there are two other CFAs. Um, and so, you know, I think we take our, our, our research very seriously, our due diligence very seriously. Um, uh, but I do, I, I, I do think you're right that, that there are, it can be abused when people, they, they use the passion and the excitement of, of, a, of, of impact 
to, I think, cloud over the lack of investment capabilities and, and experience. Um, but I think it's, and I think that the industry is growing. So as as we grow, more capital flows into it. It brings in deeper uh, talent, younger people. And I just think it's it's just going to, I think it's going to take, you know, be a, a non-linear growth in terms of uh, the quality and, and, and the capability of the industry as a whole. Um, that's an interesting question around my faith and, and what I do with, with, uh, impact investing. I would think it actually has more to do with my lived experience than it does with my, my faith. It certainly is, is part of it. Right. And, um, I think my lived experience as, you know, coming from all of us underserved, underestimated, you know, struggling to get to rise up through, through life, benefiting from those who, who mentor me and benefiting for those to this day who mention my name in a room full of opportunities when I'm not there. Um, and so this lip, my lip experience is, is I think drives me to do the work that I do. Um, and you know, it's not easy you know, investing in our community sounds great and fun. When it go when a deal goes sideways and you gotta go in there and have these tough conversations with someone who you're like, you know, I know you you survived through war and you're here and now your business is I gotta take my money back. And and like, you know, these are tough conversations on the other side of of, of investing. And I think that's where my faith comes in, where I'm like, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to come, I'm going to have this conversation from a place of love, from a place of compassion, but I still, and I explained to them, I'm like, I have obligation to my investors and um, I have given you much longer runway than typically would be the case. So I think that helps. Um, and I, I do think, Many people who are in the impact investing space have a value set that get, that that draws them to this, and that value set could be because of their religion, right? Could be because they're Mormon or they're or Jewish or whatever it is, or it could also be through a lived experience where they're like, you know, what I I know what it takes, and I I want to be a part of this growth. I want to be a part of 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 being uh, providing capital. Um, to, to a community that, that is underserved and, and under-resourced. Louis, thank you so much uh, for today. I, um, you know, we've known each other for so long and met up so many times. And today, you know, through the podcast, I got to know so much more and I hope the world gets to, to understand a little bit more about impact investing and the work that you do. Um, and I want to end on this note. Um, I want to thank you for the artwork that you bought at the Viet Film Festival, um, the gala. Um, I know that the the team at the Viet Film Festival really appreciates that. And, you know, the money that's raised uh, through galas such as um, the Viet Film Festival one, um, well, they use the money to do so many good works um, at the Viet Film Festival. So thank you for that on behalf of, um, of the team over there. I appreciate uh, that comment. And, you know, um, I believe in the universe and, you know, the Holy Spirit, depending on sort of where you're, you're, you hang your hat. Um, it just so happened that I have been wanting to buy a piece of art from M uh, G. M. Fung for a very, very long time. And <clears throat> I wanted to take my kids up to visit her studio so we can pick out a piece of art together. And we had made an appointment to go visit her the next day. Well, like it was already in the books. It was already in the calendar. And I show up to the gala and I look over. I'm like, oh my God, like there's this piece of art that is like hers. We we were just chatted. And when it came up, I'm like, I'm like the the universe and the hand of the Holy Spirit is, is playing itself out here. Um, so I went in. I paid probably a little more than I wanted to because you kept pushing the price up, which is fine. Uh, you did a great job, but we're very, uh, very happy with it. And um the next day, uh, we 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 kept that appointment with GM Fung, and we brought the painting, and um, the girls got to meet her, and she showed them the studio, 
Uh, she talked to them at length about what went into the art piece that we bought. It's called uh, Bye Bye Man. It's the name of the art piece. And um, and I was, I'm looking at it right now. And um, and her other art piece. And the girls walked away just incredibly respectful of the intelligence that went into the art piece. You know, Met Bye Bye Man and. And it couldn't have worked out better um, from from just the totality of who benefited from it and us now having this wonderful piece of of living art in our in our home and um, but yeah it, it was it was um, it was a very blessed occurrence and and so I feel feel very good about supporting you know uh, Biff. I'm I'm not a man of of any denominational faith, but I am a believer in divinity. And I am a believer in the way that things work out like this. So, you know, it, it truly was meant to be. And I, um, I appreciate it. And I, I thank, thank, uh, thank the heavens that it was you. I appreciate it. It was great. It was great. It was a great evening and a great cause. So, and thanks for having me uh, here. And, um, you know, I've heard great the great work that you're doing. And, and I know we, we've been friends for a long time. And, and I just think this is just... Uh, another chapter in our life of getting to know each other better. So thank you. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Louis. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Crystal Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast.